Olin, and salutations once again to the Truth Corps, whoever and wherever you may be on the planet. This is yours truthfully, recording on the 15th of June, 2021. And my topic for the moment is how to know that a spiritual teacher is trustworthy. To begin, I want to make it absolutely clear that my criteria for trustworthiness of a spiritual teacher are totally subjective and personal to a degree. If you want to view them in that way and take them as my personal opinion, I welcome you doing so. On the other hand, the fact is that I do have a track record. Through my life, I have encountered many different so-called spiritual teachings and methods and techniques. I have been on, in some cases, on intimate terms with those who practiced these methods and followed these spiritual programs and agendas. In other cases, I have known them peripherally. In 1991, my first book, The Seeker's Handbook, was intended to be a guide to spiritual pathfinding. So in that book, I described several dozen spiritual paths and explained them, what they were, and what you would find if you got involved in them. So it was sort of a consumer's guide to what, at that time, just when the New Age movement in the USA was peaking, was called the spiritual marketplace or the spiritual supermarket. So I put myself out in my first published book as a consumer advocate for those who are wandering around the aisles of the spiritual supermarket and wondering if they should get into the Kabbalah or Zen or Native American practices or astrology or theosophy or Sufi or Wicca The whole enchilada, I covered it in the Seeker's Handbook, which, by the way, I now consider to be a rather weak, weak on critique, and it must be true because it rhymes, it's rather weak on critique of the New Age, but a lot of what is in the Seeker's Handbook still stands. So yes, what you're going to hear now is my personal opinion. And it is also my professional opinion. So make of that as you will. Now I have quite a few points to cover. I'll tell you at the outset that my criteria for trustworthiness, let's also say authenticity in spiritual teaching, are quite extensive and extremely rigorous. But it wouldn't be wise for me to begin without offering a provisional definition of what I'm talking about. What is spiritual? Define spiritual. Define spirituality. I can offer you my definition, which I say is simply provisional so that I can proceed with what I have to say. You don't have to accept it as something absolute, but it's heuristic, meaning it's something that guides and sets up a framework for interpretation and dialogue. I grappled with that question when I was writing The Seeker's Handbook in 1989, In 1990, it came out in the spring of 1991. And at that time, I came to a conclusion which I hold to be still pretty good, pretty valid. For instance, I said categorically that 
the Abrahamic religions which dominate the world, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, are not spiritual. Why did I make that distinction, or how? Well, I decided that it might be helpful and instructive to define spiritual as any approach to life or a practice in life or a way of working on yourself that incorporates knowledge of consciousness. So to be spiritual means to be interested and involved in how consciousness works, you see? And of course, the Abrahamic religions are merely belief systems, and they tell you absolutely nothing about how consciousness works. Now, you could say, proposing a nuanced interpretation, that the factor of belief is inherent to consciousness, and that is true. Belief is a phenomenon that arises within human consciousness. Belief is a production of the human mind. It is one way that the human mind functions, particularly in the face of the big questions and the big issues, like who or what is God, where did we come from, how did we get here, and where are we going, what is the purpose of life. All of those topics belong to the realm of belief, and many people accept that their belief system answers those questions. But I say, no, 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 I'm not going to the Abrahamic rehab. I'm going to look into the nature of consciousness itself and of my own consciousness and my own mind and explore it and learn about how it actually works. And by doing so, I can say that I have a spiritual outlook rather than a religious outlook. Clear enough? So the realm of consciousness includes everything in nature, everything in the natural world. So if I'm going to undertake a study of consciousness, I'm not looking just at my own consciousness in some narcissistic way, but I'm looking at the consciousness of nature itself. Therefore, I'm looking at the dynamics of life, of biology. That is inherent to spirituality, to look into the depths of life, where it came from, how it works, and in particular, what is the special variety of the natural world that we call human life. Finally, I would add one more element to spirituality, and that would be that it contains, it provides or presents a method for working on oneself. So if you are willing to play along with me and accept that provisional definition, and I'll tell you what my standards are for knowing when a spiritual teacher or program is not trustworthy or authentic. Now, there are many people in the world today, just scan the internet, who present themselves as spiritual teachers. And... It could be said that I'm a spiritual teacher of sorts, but I'm certainly an eccentric one, and I don't really like that label because I myself don't use the word spirituality or spiritual anymore. I think it's become banal, cliched, and it has lost all tread. So I use the word montique. So what are my standards or criteria? Well, there are quite a few. I won't list them by number. I'll just go through them one by one as rapidly as I can. The first is actually rather funny. I would be pleased if you got a laugh out of this. Although, of course, I'm deadly serious about what I'm saying now. If the presumed spiritual teacher, and in every case, I'm going to refer to someone who is either considered to be a spiritual teacher or declares themselves to be so 
or both. If the presumed spiritual teacher can only teach you how to be spiritual, that is not authentic. That is not trustworthy. Prime example of this standard or the failure to meet this standard is Buddhism. Back during the time when I was writing the Seeker's Handbook and when it came out, the name Sam Harris was very big, and he was a self-proclaimed Buddhist. And he pointed out exactly what I said a few minutes ago, that the world religions teach you nothing about consciousness, but, he added, Buddhism does. Therefore, Buddhism, in his view, would be an authentic path or program of spirituality. And to a certain extent, that is true. But unfortunately, I have to add that Buddhism is a glaring example of this problem of spiritual teachers who only teach you how to be spiritual. I mean, look at the premises of Buddhism. Look at the narrative. The historical Buddha, Siddhartha, achieved enlightenment around 500 B.C., more than 2,500 years ago. And what has Buddhism become since then? It's become nothing but a tiresome, repetitive, and redundant program teaching people how to reach enlightenment. Buddhism can only teach about how to reach the enlightenment that Siddhartha attained. It fails gruesomely, on the first standard. Not only that, but if you have the expectation that 2,500 years of Buddhism teaching enlightenment on the basis of the enlightenment of Siddhartha has led to enlightenment, you are going to be sorely disappointed. I cannot name any Buddhist teacher of the 20th century, with perhaps the exception of Chogyam Trungpa, who showed anything like signs of enlightenment. And is the Dalai Lama enlightened? Are the various Hindu gurus or Buddhist gurus in the world today enlightened? Do they openly say that they're enlightened and they're there to teach you how to be enlightened? Well, if that's all they are there to teach you, then they are not authentic and not trustworthy. According to my standard, a genuine spiritual teacher, who might also be considered to be enlightened in some sense, would be able to teach you various things. The teachings coming from that individual would be diverse, rich and diverse, and they would not be restricted exclusively to the redundant message that goes like this. I attained enlightenment, I attained some superior state of spirituality, and I'm going to show you, tell you, guide you how to do the same. It's a complete failure. It doesn't work. And the state of Buddhism in the world today, in my mind, stands as evidence of that failure. So much for Buddhism, it's probably the only example I'm going to cite regarding failure to meet these standards, because were I to take the time to talk about particular cases and individuals, it would run on for far too long. Next, if the spiritual teacher cannot produce original material that is not authentic or trustworthy. What you see in the case of most presumed spiritual teachers today is that they present a mishmash of various metaphysical, philosophical, and esoteric ideas drawn from one place or another, and they mix it all up into a salad, and they serve up that salad, and then they put a little dressing on it, which is their special dressing. 
and they put that out to the world as their version of spirituality. But in fact, look closely at these individuals and ask yourself, do they present any material that is truly original, that is something that you've never heard before, that is something that comes across into your mind in a startling way and gains your attention due to its novelty. Novelty is one sign, a paramount sign, of a genuine spiritual teacher. Next is transparency. So if the presumed spiritual teacher is not entirely transparent about where they're coming from, where they acquired what they know, and the experiences or experiments they have undergone to prove the validity of what they are teaching, that is not trustworthy. Something I've noticed over the years, and you may have noticed it as well, there are certain individuals who become celebrities on the internet. They have hundreds of thousands of subscribers. They have big seminars. Their names are well known. And they're constantly talking about one thing or another, about transformation, self-empowerment, various aspects of spirituality. And they do talk about how consciousness works and how the mind works. But have you noticed that there is something missing in their discourse? They don't reveal themselves at the fundamental level. The lack of transparency is particularly obvious in this fact. You don't really know what their agenda is. Now, all of them, or almost all of them, claim to have the same agenda, to inform you and to assist in raising your consciousness and enhancing your life by knowledge, guidance, and practices. They all share that claim. But the fact is, and I think this is verified case by case if you look at it, is they never really tell you what is their program, what is their practice, what is their spiritual agenda. Just informing people or raising consciousness or telling people something that you know on the presumption that it will be valuable to them is not transparency. Transparency is when you tell people exactly where you're coming from, personally and transpersonally, and you let the world know exactly how you arrived at whatever it is you intend to teach, be it an agenda, a program, or a method. The lack of transparency, once it's brought to your attention, is screamingly obvious among these presumed spiritual teachers, many of whom are extremely popular today. Most of the time, not always, but most of the time, they will tell you how to enhance your consciousness, empower yourself, live a better life, become more aware and possibly more compassionate, etc., etc., etc. But do they ever tell you how they themselves do that? No, they don't. So lack of transparency is a serious factor and a failure of the standards that I'm proposing. The next criterion goes like this. If the spiritual teacher does not teach you in the way that your mind is designed to learn, that is not authentic. And additionally, that can be extremely problematic 
and misleading. So I would say that the fundamental requirement for any spiritual teacher who talks about mind, consciousness, awareness, would be to know the fundamentals of all that, to know how the human mind is designed. For instance, to know how the human genome is constructed, cognitively speaking. We've all heard about the human genome, and we've all heard all kinds of scientific and biological statements about it. But have you ever heard anyone say or describe specific capacities of the human animal encoded into the genome? Someone who would speak to you in that way would have to demonstrate a mastery of noetic psychology. Now, noetics is the study of intelligence, going back to the Greek word nous, which means intelligence. And that, of course, is an essential word in the Gnostic teachings received from ancient sources and even more so today. I submit to you that it is ridiculous for anyone to presume to assist you to improve your intelligence who does not, in fact, know the dynamics of how intelligence actually works. That is noetics or noetic psychology. Gnosis is noetic psychology, and planetary tantra is applied noetic psychology. For instance, a while ago I uploaded a talk entitled Chasing Fireflies with Eden Sylvester. And in the course of that talk, I described what is called the diaphonic circuit of the human mind and of the human body. I described it, I defined it, and then I described in clear and concise terms, which are provable and testable, how it works. That's an example of instruction that comes directly from a foundation of noetic psychology. So how can anyone teach you, no matter what their grand metaphysical ideas may be, no matter what they say about the seven natural laws or the, uh, what is it, the Enneagram or any of these other paradigms of consciousness, what does it matter what they can tell you about these paradigms of consciousness if they are not grounded experientially in noetic psychology? And they have to prove that by the way they speak to you and by the way that the knowledge they impart fits the design of your own mind. It speaks to what is innate to you to what you already know in some sense, perhaps without being able to define it, or it speaks to what you are on the precipice of knowing, and it takes you all the time to that precipice of knowing, inner knowing, self-knowing, but also outer knowing, knowing of how the mind of the planet operates, the cosmic principles of mind and intelligence and emotion and intention. All of that has been formulated, of course, in many different paradigms or abstract systems, the work of Gurdjieff, for instance. But none of that is applicable today. None of that can be valuable and substantially useful to people today Unless it is presented in a novel form, it has to be made over now. It has to be converted so that it speaks directly to you now. And only a teacher who is grounded in noetic psychology can do that, can deliver teachings about knowledge in that way. Next comes a really dicey subject, 
a really controversial subject, and it's something that I discussed extensively in the Seeker's Handbook, although at the time I gave a certain credibility to it, which I would not do today. That subject or topic goes under a number of expressions, the divine spark, the divine in you, the God self, the identity of human self and God, and so forth. I discussed this issue from several angles in the Seeker's Handbook. In fact, I devoted quite a bit of time to it. There's one chapter of the book called When the Radio Came to the Beach. And in that chapter, I described an event that happened in the Renaissance. An obscure monk from Constantinople brought to the court of Cosimo de' Medici, who was a Renaissance prince, a set of documents called the Hermetica. And Cosimo turned these documents over to his spiritual mentor, a man called Marsilio Ficino. And he insisted that Ficino put aside all his other work and translate the Hermetica into, I think he translated it from Greek into Latin. I don't think he translated it into Italian. However, some of the Hermetica is originally in Latin as well. So I talked about the importance of the Hermetica, and in order to explain it to my satisfaction at that time, I had to invent a word. So here I am looking at the Seeker's Handbook, and I'm looking at the lexicon, which has a dictionary of about 800 terms in it, and I'm looking at T, and here are some entries. Thelema, theocracy, theogamy, theogony, theosophy, and so forth. Now, of those words, you've heard all of them before. Theocracy, theogamy, for instance. Theosophy, certainly. But have you ever heard the word theogony? I coined that term when I wrote The Seeker's Handbook. It's spelled T-H-E-O-G-E-N-Y, genie, as in genesis, generation, epigenesis, genetics. So what it means is the generation or genetics of theos, which is divinity. Not to be confused, by the way, with the word theogony, G-O-N-Y, which is a classical account of the lives and activities or generations of divinities or gods. So what is theogony? Well, very simply, it's the notion of the divine self or the divinity within. And if you'll bear with me, at the risk of boring you out of your skulls, I'll read the original paragraph I wrote in the lexicon under this entry. Theogony, the coming to birth, genie, of a god, theos, especially the raising of a human being to a godlike status through initiation, the actualization of divinity in human form, widely understood in the past as the result achieved by participation in the mysteries. The ultimate example of cultivating and fulfilling human potential, called by Dante transhumanization, disclosed in the Hermetica as the primary goal of independent spiritual work, and cited by Maurice Bach as the effect of experiencing cosmic consciousness, emphasized with wild-eyed enthusiasm by the Romantics, such as William Blake, who wrote, Therefore God becomes as we are, that we may be as he is, end quote. And Ralph Waldo Emerson, who wrote, quote, The simplest person who in his integrity worships God 
becomes God, end quote. Echoing the age-old teaching of Eastern spirituality, quote, that no one who is not himself divine can successfully worship a divinity, end quote. That is from the Gandhava Tantra. Also called deification, the method of supreme empowerment in the mysteries, though not the aim, telos, which was co-creation. Today, probably the main bone of contention between traditional religions and the new alternative paths. Now, I need to correct myself here on a really important point. If you read Not in His Image, you will know that I make the point that deification or self-deification was not the result of initiation in the mysteries. So I was wrong on that point when I wrote The Seeker's Handbook in 1990. Since then, I have presented a rigorous meta-critique of the notion of human divinity, which I entirely reject. According to the living gnosis today, what is divine about you is not your identity. It is not some permanent non-corporeal entity. It is your intelligence. Your intelligence is divine but your identity is not. So you see there how I have learned over the past 30 years and how my knowledge of the self-knowledge of the human animal and the essence of our existence and the conditions of the human animal in this divine experiment are different than I viewed them previously in my life. I have to say, looking back, that I was never really comfortable with that idea. I thought that I found confirmation of it in ancient sources, and certainly you find a strong program of self-deification in the Hermetica. And I took that received knowledge as authentic until I found the authenticity in myself that allowed me to speak differently about this profound issue. I know that I was uncomfortable with it because uh, when I gave a course in my uh, studio at 707 East Palace Avenue in Santa Fe, I told the students one day, one Thursday evening, I think it was, talking to 30 or so students, I said, you know, I'm not too uh, confident about this notion that we are gods, so I'd like to suggest to you another way to think about it. And I said to them, how about this? You are gods in diapers, and there's an awful lot of shit in your diapers. And then I said to them, well, I think there might be another way to define a human animal, a human being, and that would be, you are not a god, yourself is not one with God, but you are a flow-through tea bag." And, of course, the T refers to Tantra. Once again, I advise to look closely at anyone today who is propagating this idea of theogony, the birth of the divine self within human consciousness. And you can always ask the same question, of anyone who is hyping that proposition. Well, if you, so-and-so, spiritual teacher, are telling me this, are you speaking from the realization 
that you propose. So if I am to believe you that I have a spark of divinity and that is my inmost self, then can I presume that you are speaking as someone who has realized that spark and therefore you are speaking to me as someone who has realized that your innate self is identical to God? Do you actually propose that I believe that? Do you actually expect me to accept that you have achieved that state and you are speaking to me from that state about how I can achieve the same? How about it? Answer that question. Or ask the spiritual teacher to answer that question and see what you get. It's pretty common knowledge among people who listen to me, who know my reputation, that I can be pretty fucking arrogant. But I assure you, my friends, that I'm not that arrogant. I'm not arrogant in that particular way. One final point to add about the problem of theogony is that it often comes up in this expression, Christ consciousness. That's simply another way of stating the theogenic idea, as I also call it. And I can't warn you too strongly that the file, the algorithm of Christ consciousness is totally and hopelessly corrupt. Finally, in closing, there are uh, two or three other standards which are sort of different from the preceding ones, but they are, in my mind, of equal importance. If a spiritual teacher evades the subject of the zenosh that is not trustworthy. Now, zenosh, spelled with an X, is my code, as you know, for the racial vector of the archons. It was through a particular tribal identity and genetic ethnicity that the archons cracked into this divine experiment. So the Archon ETs have already invaded the earth, as I've explained many times. I've also noted, and this is important, that there are two kinds of Zenosh, the racially identified Zenosh, and they are always telling you who they are and all about themselves and how special they are, and how they are, in fact, the proponents of an agenda of master race ideology. There's no secret about that. But there are also non-racial Zenosh who don't belong to that same tribal group, but who, in effect, are their accessories and enablers, without whom, in fact, they could not possibly succeed in carrying out their program. So any spiritual teacher who doesn't get around at one point or another to identify the Zenosh and to describe clearly and explicitly who they are and what they are doing is not genuine and not trustworthy. Another criterion closely related to that goes like this. If the spiritual teacher ever, in any instance, uses the N-word as an indication of something that is ultimately evil, they are not trustworthy. I can't count how many times this happens. 
It also happens, by the way, in the discourse coming out now from those who are exposing and opposing the COVID's uh, PSYOP, I'll call it, those who are challenging the COVID regime, those who are talking about the truth of epidemiology, the fact that no such monster microbe has ever been isolated, those who are exposing all the fraud and the deception around the current COVID attempt to take over the world. And time and time again, these sincere, dedicated, intelligent people make reference to the N-word in order to indicate something that is ultimately evil, the most evil thing that ever happened. In recent historical memory, was committed by those to whom the N-word is attached and along with it, the entire German nation and the German people. So anyone who uses this word as a slander or to warn you about the current evil as if what those people did was in some way comparable or parallel to the current evil is absolutely not to be trusted. Finally, Another criterion, which I I do consider quite important. If the spiritual teacher contextualizes his or her agenda and his or her methodology by reference to modern science, that is untrustworthy. That is a tactic, I'll call it, a referential tactic that cannot be trusted at all. Now, I said I wasn't going to mention any particular names, but I'll just take an easy swipe at low-hanging fruit here. There's someone called Greg Braden. Sorry about the hair, Greg, but spend less time in the wind tunnel, working on your levitation techniques. Greg Braden has a huge uh, channel. He's associated with Gaia.com. And just a couple of days ago, I saw that he released a video titled something like this. Latest discoveries in science prove that we are all connected. I was stunned. I was floored. It had never in my life occurred to me that I was connected with everything else, and all of life is a great vibrant web called Tantra, until I heard that science has proved it. See what I mean? Typically, the science that spiritual teachers cite to support their message refers to what? Quantum physics? Quantum entanglement? Relativity theory? Carl Abrams hologramic brain theory? String theory? Multiple universe theory? All of that has been proven by intelligent and dedicated people to be bogus science. So why does anyone need to cite bogus science, corrupt, fraudulent science, quackademic science, as it's been called? Why does anyone need to cite that to back up the authenticity of the spiritual teachings they presume to offer. If they do so, you can count on it. They are not to be trusted. And the message they are offering you is not authentic. 
So that is the sum total of the standards I wished to present in this talk. Enough said. I'll be seeing you in the beauty to come.